So uh, Brother Rayson had a dream that my dad made coffee for. <laughs> that, was the best, that was the best thing I've ever heard in my life, you know. Uh, because one, my, my dad doesn't drink coffee. <laughs> he doesn't drink coffee. Uh, anyway, praise God for that testimony. Wow, I, I, was so, I, I was so blessed by what was shared. And I think that's really the power of what God does, right? When His amazing grace comes and visits a person, we begin to see how the Lord begins to change a person thoroughly. Um, we're going to start a new series this month that I'm really excited about, which is called the Identity Series. You know, you and I, before we were a Christian, we were something else, right? And then after becoming a Christian, there was an evidence of God's change in our life. So let's revisit this a little now. Before becoming born again, I used to be, check on screen, uh, the sermon title is, Who Am I Really? Before becoming born again, I used to be. I'm going to give you just four simple points here. The first one, a child of wrath. Now, this might be, if you're a new Christian, this might be a new term, but it simply means, as the Bible says, that we were destined for God's anger and judgment. So we were a child of wrath. We might be cute when we were young. We might be pretty handsome, but still... The point is, how God sees it is, we are sinners and we deserve condemnation. We deserve destruction. So we were child of wrath. The second thing, we were blind. We were blind unbelievers. Somehow, we could hear about God, but because our hearts are so far away, there's a blindness. And the minute you became a Christian, you, you start to see that blindness go away, right? You start to see the world differently. You start to see that, okay, God made the world and and all that. You begin to believe the Bible stories, the instructions of the Word of God. But before that, you could not see. I could not see. We were blind. You might even attend church for many years, but still blind, right? Because you attend, but you're not really engaged with God. You, you, you are, and that's my story, right? I'm a second generation Christian. My dad is the first generation. I came to church way before I believed, if that makes sense. I was born into the church, but I was not born into Christ when I first came, right? It, it, I think when I was 15 years old, that's when I really encountered God. So for the first 14 years of my life, I heard about God, but I was still blind. I, I sang the songs, you know? I listened to enough sermons, right? But nothing happened. There was nothing real. I was still blind. Well, the third one, before becoming a Christian or being born again, we were deceived, you say, Pastor, I'm not deceived. I, I know things and I, I investigate and I research. The problem of deception is that it's very subtle. Uh, we, we need to understand that deception is one of those things where it can sound truthful, but it's built on lies that are very, very clever. And that's what Satan does all the time. Like we know the first deception Eve had, right? It was a very simple twist, just a simple twist. Satan didn't go outright and say to Eve, uh, God didn't say anything. He didn't say to Eve that God didn't tell you this or that. Instead, he just shifted a little bit the goalpost. And that's what deception does. Deception doesn't start big. Deception always starts very little by little, small little increments until it becomes a big, big issue, right? Even for some of you, you might remember the first time you started to believe that God loves you, right? Now, deception doesn't say God doesn't love you. Deception would say, does God love you as much as you think? That's what deception is. And then little by little, it chips away whatever belief you might have. And deception was something that we all were before the cross of Jesus Christ was real in our lives. We were deceived. And the fourth one, we were destined for hell. We were destined for hell. As a child of wrath, as a blind unbeliever, as a deceived person, we were destined to eventually go to hell when we die. That was the case before we became a believer. Now let's talk about what happens after salvation. And we're going to dive into four things as well that I think we know, but sometimes our identity is only made strong with reinforcements. Let me explain what I mean, okay? Um, how many of you know that your husband, wife, or children love you? Can I see your hands? How many of you know that your family loves you? Okay. Put it down. 
How many of you still need to hear it from them? Put up your hands. Right, we still need to hear it. Because even if you have an identity, you're loved by your mom, your dad, you're loved by your husband, your wife, you're loved by your children. Even if you have that, you need it to be reinforced. Identity is not stagnant. Does it make sense? Identity continues to evolve. You can say you're a child of God, but what does that mean year one versus year 10 versus year 20 versus the day you're about to die and go and see Jesus, right? Like our identity evolves. It, 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 it's not stagnant. It should become richer, right? Like I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a pastor, right? I knew that long ago. Now with more time and more maturity, it has to evolve. It has to be strengthened. And so that's the reason for today's sermon. I, I want us to be strengthened in our identity in God because we have to place our identity somewhere. Where are you going to place your identity? Let's get going. The first one, after receiving salvation, I am now, write this down, loved as a child of God. Now, I intentionally put the words loved as a child of God because it's still possible you can say, I'm a child of God, but I'm not sure whether Papa God really loves me. See, that's where the lies come in, right? Yeah, I, I'm a child of God. That's not a problem. But how much does God love me as His child? You see what I'm saying? So I, I framed it together. You have to see it. We are loved as a child of God. And, and the reference is 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Check it out on screen. Very beautiful verse. John, the apostle says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us. Let's pause here, okay? Do you notice that John is saying you can identify what love it is. You can see for your own heart, mind, soul, and eyes. You can see the love that God is pouring to you. And that's where if we are now in a place that we don't really know that God loves us, you have to now relook at it with fresh eyes. You have to see past your hurts, your disappointments, the betrayals you face. You have to see past all the anguish and pain you have gone through. Because... That's the truth, isn't it? It's like when we are in pain, it clouds sometimes the truth. When we go through certain situations, we begin to doubt and our fears creep in. Isn't that all of us? Like when times are really good, it's so easy to believe that people around us love us. But when times are really bad, that's when all sorts of thoughts come in. And that's when the enemy strikes the hardest. Because... Satan is not going to use happy days to pull away your faith. That's not how it works. Satan many times uses the dark night of the soul, the, the painful moments of life, to chip away at the pillar of your strength. How does he do that? You say you're a child of God. Why is this happening to you? Does God really love you? If he let you go through that crisis, and then he begins to hit at us and hurl all those doubts and accusations at us. That's why John says, hey, 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 don't just think that love cannot be seen. He says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us. So that's where you might say, but pastor, I don't see it. I don't, I don't see the love that God has for me. And, and this is something you have to do it yourself. Let me just be a guide to you because if you say to me, Pastor, I don't think God loves me and I can prove it in, in my life and we sat down 10 minutes and my dad made you coffee, you know, then we sit down and I talk to you, you might be able to tell me a story that I would say, wow, it really seems like God doesn't love you, right? But we would be wrong. We would be absolutely wrong because even Job, when he was going through all the losses, it seems like God abandoned him. It seems like God was really far away. What about Jesus at the cross when he said, my God, why have you forsaken me? It seems like Father God was not there. It seems, it feels like it, like God has forsaken you. But John is saying, look, look deeper, look further. Look deep within and you begin to see that actually God loves you and he loves you so much that you have to look very closely, see what kind of love the Father has given to us. Look at what it says next, that we should be caught children of God and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. 
Pastor, I, in a world that is so hateful, why uh, is the world hateful? Because the Bible says the world doesn't know God, right? Unless God loves them and shows them His love, the, the unbelieving world does not know this true and living God. And, but you do. You have access. You have received John 3.16. You have encountered Him in different parts of your life. You, you have experienced. Now you say, Pastor, I experienced God's love three years ago, but now I don't, I don't experience His love. Then go back to where you first started, the Bible would say. Go back to where you first begun your faith. Go back to that journey again. Because sometimes in order to make strides forward, we actually do have to revisit some parts of our past. You say, but pastor, I thought I should not be living in the past. No one asked you to live in the past. You have to re-examine a bit on where you first left off the love of God. So if you say, pastor, I received God's love three years ago, but now the love of God seems to be dry, then revisit what happened three years ago. What, what was different then? And you're going to find a pattern. If you go back three years ago, very likely you were doing your quiet time more. Very likely you were speaking to God more. Very likely you were considering the words of Scripture more. Very, very likely you were spending more time in His presence and then you encountered His love. See the kind of love the Father has for you. You go back there. You revisit and then now you carve a new timeline in 2024. 2021, you encounter God's love. Now you feel like you haven't. Go back, revisit, come back stronger and say, okay, I have to take what I've learned, those pillars of strength, and bring it now to my present and begin to live it out. Friend, you are loved as a child of God. Help me out before we get to the second point. Turn to the person next to you and say, God loves you, amen. God loves you. Turn to the other person and say, you are loved as a child. You are loved as a child, Amen. Second point, write this down very quickly. You are justified by faith. Justified by faith. Now, this word justification or justified means this, okay? That you are a sinner, but now God doesn't see you as a sinner that way. Rather, you are a sinner saved by grace. We all hear this phrase. Justification is not the same as just as you have never sinned, but it means that now God gives you a new lease. You used to be a sinner, but now you are different. You have been redeemed, transformed. You have been changed. So now you are justified. Now look at what it says in Galatians 2 verse 16. This is important. You have to revisit it, okay? And you say, Pastor, why do I need this? This is why, all right? Some of you as Christians now, you have been falling back into old patterns of sin, maybe. You know what I'm saying? Let's say God redeemed you, and for a season, you are seeing, wow, breakthrough after breakthrough. Perhaps you've hit some disappointments and now you're going back to those old things, to those old patterns of sin. And you're saying, how, how can that be? I'm a Christian. Why am I going back to all those places and things that I know it's not right? Why is that happening? And so you need to see that you're justified by faith, not to keep on sinning, but to identify with the new pattern of life that you and I should have. I'll explain it in a moment, all right? Check out on, on the verse. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law. Pause here. You said, Pastor, what, what in the world is pausing? Paul is saying this, is okay? You can't earn your salvation. That's what he's saying. You cannot be justified by what you do. You said, well, what do you mean, Pastor? It means this, right? I can't love enough for God to say, you don't need my love your love is enough to get to heaven. I, I, I can't do anything good in of myself enough to give myself the title, I'm justified. I can't. Which means, why? Because the next statement, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So justification happens not by you and I working out the law, but what Christ has done for us. So we have faith in what Christ has done for us. Look at this, right? So we also have belief in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ, not by our works of the law, because by those works, no one will be justified. Okay, okay. I, I need to explain a bit further, okay? We all know this truth, right? We are saved by grace through faith so that no one can boast, Ephesians 2, 9, right? Now, this is how it works, right? 
You say, Pastor, how, how, I know all this, but how do I apply it as application in my life? This is what happens, okay? Let's say I have a lying problem. Before I'm a Christian, I lie all the time. I just keep telling lies, white lies, black lies, brown lies, all kinds of lies. Okay, I'm just a, a frequent, frequent liar, frequent flyer, frequent liar. I just frequent liar, right? And then I got saved and, and God cleansed my mouth. And now I begin to speak truth. I begin to tell the truth, right? Now I, I hit a stage, maybe my Christian life becomes lukewarm. And I, and I begin to now revert back to my old ways of lies. So I'm asking the question, how, how can that be? You know, God saved me from my lying lips, but now I'm back to a, being a liar. What should I do? Should I need to get saved again? The answer is no. You, how do you get saved again? You don't get saved again. You remember where God picked you up. You remember what God did for you. You say, but how, how does that work? This is how it works, all right? By your own works, you can't be justified. Therefore, if you say, I'm going to clean myself up. I'm going to stop lying by my own strength. There's no power. God saved you from your lying lips. His power working through you. Now you cannot say, I'm going to use my own power to stop lying. It's not going to work. So where is the power? The power is, the Bible says, you are justified by faith in Christ. You say, how does it work? Jesus never told a lie. On the cross, he died for a liar like you. So that means that, listen, all your lies went to the cross. It was nailed to the cross. So justification by faith looks like this. I'm a liar. Jesus is a truth teller. I can't change myself. Jesus, help me. Where is my help coming from? Bible would say from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, in the Old Testament, New Testament, it would show all my lies flew on Jesus' body and he sacrificed himself so that my lies could be destroyed. So you look at the cross again. Faith is by looking at Jesus, right? So you look at Jesus again. What did he do for me? Listen, he died to set me free from lies. And then your heart begins to melt again. You see the point? You see, what happens is when we, when we become lukewarm, it's, it's, it's like a bit like bochap really, you know what I'm saying? Like our heart is like, no, I, I should be doing good, but I now really want to go back to the world. We're, we're in tosso to and fro. And then we remember our real identity. You see, like I, I use in the Bible example, Samson is one of those weird Bible examples that I don't know how to preach Samson properly. Because... Most of the time I read about Samson, in fact, half the time I read about Samson doing amazing works of faith, he's destroying enemies left and right. And then the other half the time, I see Samson living a life like an unbeliever. He's not only sleeping around, he's going to prostitutes every day. He's, he's, doing, he's doing everything that God said not to do. He did it. He broke everything that God said not to do. And yet, Samson is one of those weird situations. Is he justified by faith or is he working out the works of the law? It's kind of like in the middle sometimes. We see God working through him. The Bible says the Spirit of God was upon Samson. So on those moments, we see Samson as a hero, smiting down the enemy. On the other time, we see Samson like a fallen man, like a Christian that is struggling in his sin, falling and falling and falling and falling, until we see, of course, he comes crashing down. We see that story we are amazed that God could still use him. And we are thinking, what, what do I do with that? And this is how we need to see it properly, okay? Because Samson is one of those weird classic cases that we don't know how to identify. But we know how to see what happens when we are lukewarm. When we are lukewarm, at times, we do find the power of God working through us. We can prophesy, we can speak things, we can give word, people word of knowledge, we can counsel, we can edify, we can lead, we can give we can so sing songs, we can preach, we can, like there's power of God working through us and then half the other time we are saying, you know, I feel like a hypocrite. I feel like I'm back into the world. Said, Pastor, what should I do if I'm in that state? Go back to that verse. It explains. If you are justifying yourself by your work and your strength, you will definitely fall. It's by faith in Jesus Christ that the power of sin and the power of the enemy begins to be loosened from you. 
you are now taken up from the grip of the enemy into new love and life and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how it works. That's how it works. Now, have any of you tried? Have you ever, any of you tried to kill sin by your own strength? I know I did, you know. Does it work? Does it work? Okay, give an example. Anger is one of those things that I hear many Christians say they want to destroy, right? Have you ever tried to destroy anger by your own strength? Does it work? In fact, this is what, this is what happens, right? The more you try to destroy anger with your own strength, the more what you get. Angry, you know. <laughs> you get more angry. You know why I show you what I mean, right? Okay, today I won't get angry. Today I won't get angry, right? You tell yourself, right? Something happens, makes you angry, and now you are angry, and now you're angry with two people. With the person that made you angry and also yourself. Now you're angry yourself. Say, I told myself I won't be angry. I, ah, ah. you know, and then, you get my point. It, if, if you try to use your own strength to defeat an unseen villain, which is the enemy, Satan, you're going to lose. That's why you've got to be justified by faith because, friends, this is a spiritual realm. This is not a physical realm. You will lose. If it's a spiritual realm, because many times we are living in a physical body, we can't see past a certain level. Faith is the spiritual realm. I am justified by faith. God, so this is how it works practically. We'll get to the third point in a moment's time. Let's say lying, anger, lust, whatever the issue it is, you want it to be melted by the Lord. You can't attack lust or greed or whatever it is by your own strength. It doesn't work. Now you have to see the cross of Jesus Christ and say, Lord, your word says that I'm justified by faith, through faith in Christ. Lord, show me what that means, please. How do I have deliverance and victory from fallenness through Jesus Christ and not by my own works? How, oh God? And the Lord will reveal. God is a good father, amen. God is a good father, he will show us as a good father the steps that we can take so that the enemy's hold over us is loosened and the, the love of God will shine through in our life. But giving you this last revisit example would be, so if you have a lying problem, see Jesus, the truth teller, the non-liar, the perfect son of God, dying in your place for your lies. If you're greedy for your greed, if you're lustful, for your lust, if you are prideful, for your pride. Jesus stepped in and died for that very thing you're struggling with. You said, what does it mean? In other places, the Bible would say, how can sin continue when it died on a cross? In Romans, it says things like that, which means that you have to see your sin dying by seeing Jesus die for you. So spend time meditating on Jesus' death for you. Jesus dying for your sins to die. And then you begin to see the power of sin begin to drop. Amen. Next one. Part C. You're made holy and sanctified. Check out on screen Hebrews 10.10. 10. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Church, is it weird that God tells us in many places that we should be holy as our Heavenly Father is holy? Again, it feels like we're making ourselves holy. It doesn't work that way, right? Jesus said elsewhere, you can wash your body many times, but as long as your inside is not washed, you're still unclean. He used this example to the Pharisees. He said, you know, no one washes the outside of the cup. You wash the inside of the cup, Jesus says, and as you wash the inside, the outside will be washed as well. It makes sense, right? We've all washed dishes before. We know how it feels like. If you wash the inside, the outside is so easy. The outside is not the problem. The inside is where the grime, the grease, the oiliness, the food stains are there. You wash the inside, the outside will be clean. Here's what happens though for us as Christians. Sometimes we're trying to wash our inside but we can't have access. It's back to the point, we can't wash our inside because you don't have the power to do that. We can wash our outside. So we can look more presentable and feel like we are less of a sinner by how we present ourselves outwardly to people. Do you get my point? Have you ever watched those kind of true crime stories, right? 
And, and, and for instance, one of those horrendous true crime stories is when they say, wow, this guy, how come he's a mass murderer? And every one of his neighborhood would say, but he's such a nice guy. How can this nice guy be a murderer? And it's simple to explain. Because his inside is not washed, he just washes outside so that people will look at him and trust him. But his mind is thinking of killing you, murdering you. Do you see the point? You cannot wash your outside enough to change your inside. The inside must be changed. So when the Bible says, hey, you're a holy people, we are holy people, I know what we feel. We would say, but God, I don't feel holy. I, I, Lord, you are holy, I know, but I don't feel holy. And you need to understand that holiness has nothing to do with feelings. It's not you feel cold, you feel hot, you feel shocked, you feel it. Holiness is not a feeling. Holiness is a title deed. I'll give you a classic example, all right? Those of you new homeowners, right? Do you feel like you own a home or do you feel your, your home owns you? It depends, right? If you are broke, like many people that are first starting buying a house, yeah, you buy a house, but do you really feel like you own the house or the house owns you? That's the same concept as holiness. Do you get it? Because you're still starting out, you're not fully able to process what it means like holiness is a title deed. It's not how you feel. It's what God grants to you when He saved you and died for you. It's the same like some of us are still struggling with this notion. Pastor, I know, I know I'm a child of God. But I don't feel like a child of God, you know. You see what I'm saying? It, it, it's that dissonance. That place where the enemy still has got a hold on us. What is it right now that you know God wants to say to you, not even a pastor, what, what, what is it that God wants to say to you that you have been struggling to believe? God gives you a second chance. God has washed away all your past, all the filthiness. Do you believe that? Pastor, I don't, I don't really know. I, I don't really know. You know, some of you actually, deep down, you say to yourself, Actually, I don't blame it if God doesn't love me because of all the stuff I've done, I don't think I deserve love. Do you know that's a lie from Satan? Do, do, do you know that's a lie? It needs to be broken. It needs to be broken. There are many lies that have come in to rob us of our inheritance in Christ, really. Like God says to us, now that you are in me, you are made holy. Be holy, Jesus says, as my heavenly Father is holy. But, 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 but you're looking at yourself. Right, because you look at how unworthy you are. You, you cannot start by that with faith. Faith is not looking at yourself. Faith is looking at, is Jesus holy? Church, is Jesus holy? Oh, no answer. Let me ask again. Is Jesus holy, Tampanese? Amen. I see you saying amen. Is Jesus holy, Woodlands? He's holy, right? Jesus says, be holy as my heavenly Father is holy. I died to make you holy. Are you holy, church? I am. We are. Now, we might see some have ways of unholiness in our life that needs to be destroyed. But you see, you must start identity with I am holy in Christ and then begin to shed off the past rather than I'm so unholy, I'm so unholy, I'm so unholy, I'm so unholy. Both have a different way of living. The one that says I'm holy in Christ now is trying his best to live out faith. Listen, eh? the one that says, I'm unholy, I'm unholy. You know what you're trying to do? You're trying to get rid of sin by your habits and your own strength. Big difference, you know? Okay, coming back to identity. I'm loved by God. I'm loved by God. What happens? You're now trying to live out His love. Look, eh? I don't know whether God loves me. I don't know whether God loves me. What you're trying to do? Now you're trying to do things to earn God's love. You always see yourself as a victim. This side, see yourself as a victim. This side, see yourself as victory in Christ. Listen, does the Bible says, I'm less of a victor from Christ, through Christ who love us all. I'm more than a conqueror through Christ who love me. This side says, I am in Christ. I'm working out my salvation in fear and trembling. I'm now inheriting what God has for me. This side is saying, I'm trying to do everything I can to get God to accept me, love me. Do, do you see the difference in both sides? You said, Pastor, I see it now. Okay, then walk in this. You, you say, Pastor, I, I have still things in my life that needs to be destroyed. 
You know, truthfully, pastor, if people know my life, they would think I'm not a Christian. Well, if I look at Samson's life, I would also think he's not a Christian. Don't look at those things now. Look at what God has done for you first. Step into that place. I'm more than a conqueror through Christ who loved me. What does that mean, pastor? It means this. God is going to conquer my greed, my lust, my pride. He's going he's to conquer it. I'm more than a conqueror. Why? Because I can't do it myself. He is going to conquer it on my behalf and He's going to justify me through that. He's going to impute to me a righteousness that is not my own, the Bible says. See, the, the, the gospel is what Jesus did for us. You know what's happening for many of us Christians? After we receive what Jesus did for me, we tend to become Christians to say, what do I do for myself? We tend to. We tend to be looking at what can I do for myself? What can I do to? And we miss the whole point. We need to go back to where we first started for some of us. What did Jesus do for me? And I live out through that identity. That's where the pure identity starts from. If you live from this identity, you'll always be never enough. You'll never be loved enough. You'll never be accepted enough. You'll never be good enough. You'll never, you'll never be the person that you think you should be. You'll always be from behind. This one is in front. You know, we hear this verse, right? We are the head and not the tail, right? This is where the head is. This is the tail. I'm trying to catch up. And when this is all about your own strength, look, look, look at me. This is all about all your own strength. This is about the strength of God, not you, you know, by the way, just let you know. This is the strength of Jesus Christ. Everything is through Him. By faith in Christ, I'm saved. It's through Him. I'm more than a conqueror true Christ. Listen again, I'm more than a conqueror true Christ who loved me. It's Him. I'm the head and not the tail. This, this is where it is. It's not pride. This is confidence in the Lord. This is the tail. I'm always looking from behind. I'm saying, how come, how come this person can speak in tongues? How come this one got prophecy? How come not this one? You are looking from behind. You're looking at the wrong place. You don't know what's the activity of God because you're at the tail. You need to be the head. You need to come to this place where you say, God, I need to throw away all my self-hatred, my self-victimization, all the things that identify myself that has nothing to do with what your word said about me. Let me ask you a question. Now that you're in Christ, does God identify you as a liar, a cheat, an adulterer, a sinful, wicked, terrible person? Or does he call you, you're a child of God, you're redeemed. You've been sanctified, you've been made holy. Are these not words we know and sing and read in the scriptures? So I need to come back here. And even though, yes, as a child of God, I still sometimes do those things that I don't want to do. But I cannot identify those things again. I need to go to this pathway. Peter denied Jesus three times. We know that, right? You see later on, Jesus redeemed him. Later on, we assume that's the end of it. That's not. The Bible says, Paul the Apostle opposed Peter in his face because there was one stage that Peter was showing hypocrisy. He was showing favoritism to the Jews when they came instead of the Gentiles and he ate with the Jews and not the Gentiles and kind of racism kind of thing. And Paul had to oppose Peter in his face. Hey, I thought Peter, you've learned. See, this is what we talk as Christians, right? Hey, I thought you've learned, right? You denied Jesus three times, right? Jesus redeemed you from that, right? And then now you're still sinning again. But again, friends, I think we all need to have a bit more grace for one another. And also, maybe friends, listen, listen, okay? For those of you that's constantly condemning yourself, you may need to give yourself a bit more grace, listen, because God's grace is more than enough for you. And you have... This is what happens, right? I, Pastor, I know. God's grace is more than enough. Here's what happens though. For you, when you see God's grace, you're not seeing a flood of God's grace coming to you. You see drops. You're seeing it wrong, you know. You're seeing a stingy God, not a gracious God. A gracious God is not, you need grace, huh? Yeah. Doom. One drop. You, you, you thirsty, yeah? Hey, friends, when I on the tap, it's a picture of God's grace. I on the tap, God doesn't deny me water. I on the tap, there's water. 
Do you think God's grace is less than the tap you on or the shower that you use? God's grace should be seen like a huge dam. Once the thing is up, the water gushes out. It doesn't trickle out. It gushes out. Lord, your grace is enough for me. Grace to live a new life. Grace to leave the old ways. Grace to be victorious in Christ. Grace to champion the lost. Grace to give to the poor. Grace to do all that you have given me. New identity. And that's what I want for you and me. Because the other way, it feels like we're a Christian, but not quite. If I'm here, it feels like I know enough about God, but I'm still living in an old covenant. It, it doesn't feel like I'm victorious. Make sense? And friends, before you think I'm judging you, no, I, I used to know what that feels like. I, I, I used to feel exactly like this spot. I got to serve more. I got to give more. I got to, it's always about me. That's not what faith is. Faith is about Jesus. So if you're suffering from condemnation, look at what Jesus did. He was condemned in your place, you know. He took it, you know. He actually took it. We'll come to the last point, we'll close up. Fourth point. Point D and the worship team, maybe you can prepare a new creation in Christ. Fourth point. Write this down. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. I want you to say it out loud. I'm a new creation. Say it out loud. One more time. Say it out loud. I'm a new creation. Say it one more time. I'm a new creation. Now, here's what many Christians don't quite understand when they first got saved, right? God didn't try to modify you from who you used to be to who you now are in Christ. It's not a modification. You know it's a modification, right? It's like taking your current phone and doing some modification in software or hardware. That's not what new creation means. New creation is like this, okay? New creation is... You used to be the old Nokia. La. Do, 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 do. You know, the snake on the, yeah. Okay, those of you too young, you don't understand, but it's fine. The, the Nokia or Blackberry, la, okay? And then, bah, iPhone 15 Pro Max, new creation. It, it, it's a completely different thing. It's the old is destroyed and the new creation has come. So it's not modification. Because some of us as Christians think of it as modification. So we live out through a modification thing. This is what I mean, okay? Today I tell 10 lies. As a non-Christian, now as a Christian, I tell eight lies a day. La. It's improvement. That's not new creation. That is modification. You say, what's the difference? Modification is still about you. It's still about you trying to fit your life to God. New creation is this. God, now that you saved me, you have to do whatever you need in my life to make me more like you. Because I belong to you now, so therefore... I'm going to release my full will, my heart, body, mind, and soul, full surrender. And here's where the struggle really is. You said, Pastor, I believe that I should be a new Christian. Well, why is it feeling like I'm modification? Here's why. You haven't fully surrendered. You say, what do you mean? So I use the example, your Nokia. So yeah, that Nokia, very cute one, can keep changing all the, <laughs> all the, all the design, right? So yeah, that Nokia, right? And then I ask you, you said, okay, brother, you have this Nokia phone. Don't worry, okay? Your inside consciousness will be the same, but don't mind, huh? We destroy it and recreate another one. And you say, no, 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 pastor, cannot, cannot, cannot. God cannot, cannot. You change the, the you know, maybe change the specs inside. I said, it cannot, no. It's a completely different creature, you know. Like one is the old one. The new one, you cannot just take the old, you have to completely change it. And this is where many Christians struggle. And this is where, when we say things like, we have to surrender fully to God, this is where the struggle really is. The struggle is how much do we trust God to surrender everything to Him? And I, I'll be honest with you, that's why our prayers tend not to be surrender prayers. Our prayers tend not to be, God, you own my life. Our prayers tend to be, God, I need this in my life. And since you love me, give that to me. We, we tend to pray like that. We tend to. Not judging is the truth, but we tend to pray like God, since you're my God. So hear my prayer on this. And we don't realize that actually God, many times, He actually wants us to fully surrender first. As we fully surrender, 
He can take what we used to be, destroy it, and a new creature comes out. So it's the lack of surrender that we don't see the power of God in our life. It's not, this is what many of us are trying to do. Lord, show me your power, then I surrender. That's not how it works. There's nowhere in the New Testament that Jesus did that. Many times Jesus would say to a person he just met, you follow me. He says, if you want to follow me, deny yourself, take up the cross, follow me. The person might say, hmm, you haven't shown me enough, Jesus. You only show me a bit of miracle here and there. I hear a teaching, not bad, but I can't surrender to you. That's what many Christians do. I can't fully surrender. I can surrender my Sunday. I'm here. Sunday, praise God, I'm here. I'm here Sunday, yes, but I can't fully surrender. So what you've done is you've modified your Nokia. You've just modified a little of who you used to be and you haven't seen the power of God fully rest on you. Now, God is gracious and even in our modification, God is patient, right? How many years of modification we're trying to become a better person? But you notice that if you are saying, I'm trying to be a better person, very likely you have done it by your own strength. It's better to say, God, you know what, I've, what kind of a person I am. Maybe some people think I'm good, some people think I'm bad, but it's not important what they think, it's important what you think and what you say about me. Lord, I'm a bad person without your grace. But by your grace, I'm now good. I'm holy, I'm pleasing, I'm acceptable. Before you, I'm a priest, I'm a king, I'm your bride, I'm the apple of your eye, I'm a child of God. These, by the way, these are all the things the Bible says about you when you fully surrender. Isn't that amazing? So here's what happens on church, right? This is what happens, right? I, I'm going to suspect this as we close, okay? Some of us, we hear that and we say, it's, I want that, but pastor, I fear to fully surrender because this is what the fear is, okay? This is what the fear is. And trust me, I understand. If I fully surrender, I'm afraid that God will ask me to do something I don't want to do. And I understand that's a lie of the enemy, but let me give you a better way to explain it. This is what I mean, okay? From an old creature, we are still thinking like an old creature, right? So I, I'm scared God tells me to do something I don't want to do. True, because you're still thinking like an old creature. What if you let your old creature die in the presence of God that He can give you that new creature in you? that new person that you always wanted to be. You said, Pastor, I've always wanted to be generous, but I fear being generous because when I'm generous, I lose out. Friends, I understand that notion, but let me help you with this, okay? In Christ, you have everything. Now, you can't believe that statement until your old person dies. The old person must die in the presence of God so that that new man now takes on by faith in Jesus Christ. When Jesus says, this is what I'll do for you, this is what I've do for you, this is what I've done for you, do you believe it? If we're struggling, it's very likely that old man, that old person in us, that old Nokia phone, we're trying to hold on to it, we're hearing the promises of the new iPhone versus the Nokia, and we're saying, now nah, it's too good to be true, it's too far away, because you're using your own mind on how you can modify your old self to the new self. That doesn't work. Surrender looks like this. Lord, Put me in the fire now. Strip me out if you need to. Destroy that old thing and remake me into what you want me to be. And that's why it's so amazing, guys, that disciples, before they were truly surrendered, were freaking out for their lives like what any of us would be. They were fighting for position. Jesus is going to die. Who's next? Hey, 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 I think I'm going to be second in command, first in command once Jesus is gone. Right? That was them. They were fighting. They were still that old man. You see what happened when God transformed them? They were no longer fighting what it used to be, what it used to look like. They're not looking at the victim situation. They're looking at, now I'm fully His. I fully belong to God. I'm fully redeemed. I'm fully cleansed. I'm fully loved. And that's what I want for you and me. As your pastor, I want that for you and me. We can fully see the expression of God's love in the way that He said it. So now how do we redeem it? Well, we redeem it by full surrender. 
And we're going to close right now. Here's a very quick thing. There's two categories of people that need to come up very quick, okay, as we close the service. First group of people is those of you that say, I want to be a Christian. Today I believe, I heard Brother Rayson's testimony, wow, I didn't know that life can be so different when I believe in Christ. It will, it can, it should, you must. And the second group of people that need to come are those that says, you know, Pastor, I do feel like I want to rededicate my life to the Lord. Because yes, I believe that I should be a better Christian, but I, I know what you mean, Pastor. I've been living like a tail. <laughs> I've been fighting for myself from my own position rather than fighting from the position of God's strength. This is what God has done for me. I still have been somehow trying to live life by my own strength. Two categories of people that need to come. We, we, have, we are short of time, guys, so let's respond very quickly. Shall we all stand, Templeys Woodlands? And anyone in the overflow, would you stand? As the worship team leads us in this song, the Child of God song, we'll open up the floor very quickly for you to respond and then we'll pray and then Pastor William will close out the service. Is that okay? So as we sing the song, please make your way to the front, those of you that need to respond. Praise the Lord. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Oh, make your way to the front. Praise God. I am a child. God. Yes, sister, come on. Come on. God bless you. To Praise the Lord. Come on, sister, come on. I am a child of God. Yes, wow, well, I see you, brother, in Tampanese. Keep coming, keep coming. Wow, many of you responding, praise God. Praise God. I am a child Let's sing it again. Woodlands, those of you that want to respond, the space. Come on. Oh brother, good to see you, brother. Come on down. Praise God. Good to see you. Just one more time, the chorus. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. You know, friends, a surrendered life is the best life. We surrender to God's will, we surrender to God's plan. We surrender to God's grace. And believe you me, we all need help to fully surrender, right? We all need help. And so let's pray together right now. Friends, shall we lift up our hands? Shall we lift up our hands? Let's say this prayer together after me. Dear Lord Jesus, today, I surrender to you. Help me to surrender fully. I want to be the head and not the tail. I want to be more than a conqueror through Christ who loved me. I want to receive all the truth that you have given. Lord Jesus, please forgive all my sin and help me, help me to place faith in Jesus Christ alone. Today I make a stand that I will surrender my heart, soul, and mind fully to you, Lord. Change me and do with me what you want me to become. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I'm a child of God. I'm holy. I'm redeemed. I'm blessed. I'm loved. I am yours, O oh God. In Jesus' name, amen. Give God praise. Now, now very quickly, look at me. Guys, look at me. This is the time that we begin to live out 
our new identity. So this is one thing I'll say before I'm done. In this week itself, you're going to hear lies said about you. You could be telling lies to yourself about you. Someone could be saying lies about you. Don't hear those lies. You get back to the grace of God. I'm redeemed. That used to be me. I'm no longer that anymore. Now I'm living out that new life in God. People are always going to try to put you down. Don't let that happen. You're the head, not the tail. Go with the grace of God and say, God, this is where I stand, Lord. I receive more and more of your grace. And finally, the beautiful thing, friends, is that the identity of God will stick. The identity of God will strengthen you. The identity of God will help you to make you whole. Amen and amen. God bless you. Amen. God bless.